thanks to all the organizers, uh, especially for continuing this uh, this great seminar series, which I think is a service to the community. Um, so I'm returning to the topic, uh, which was partly in my thesis. And I remember uh, maybe it was uh, Henrik Ivaniets asking me 30 some years ago, why are you still working on Waring's problem? <laughs> so anyway, I, um, maybe this is an answer. Um, so uh, I, I'm not presuming that everybody um, is familiar with Waring's problem. I'll have a little um, introductory spiel but I'd like to um, talk about a new result. And, and most of this talk is joint with Jörg Pruden, and that will be made clear again later on. Good. Okay, so the obligatory uh, blah, blah. Um, so the conjecture of Waring goes back to 1770. This is Edward Waring, not uh, the famous British sports commentator, Eddie Waring, about which uh, nobody in the audience will know anything about. Um, so uh, Waring made a conjecture which uh, I think there's a, there's a typo actually in the usual um, way in which this is written in Latin, but I don't know where it is. Anyway, the gist of the conjecture is that, um, well, let's, let's write down the gist in some language which is a bit more plausible for modern, modern readers. So every natural number is a sum of at most nine positive integral cubes, also a sum of at most 19 biquadrates and so on. So, um, so let's have some notation just to uh, summarize this in ways we can use in brief form. So little g of k is traditionally used to denote the least number s, so, so that every natural number is the sum of at most s k powers of natural numbers. Um, so uh, Waring's conjecture claims in this language that g of 3 is at most 9 and g of 4 is at most 19. g of k is finite in general. Um, so this, this bound on the number of surrounds should not um, and on the number that you're representing, this is the point. Okay, and so uh, just to show that uh, I have time to doodle, um, it turns out that uh, Lagrange proved that all uh, natural numbers were some of the most four positive squares. Um, and 2022 does not disprove this, this, uh, this theorem. It's, uh, it is a theorem. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that the uh, there are special reasons why this little j of k problem is not the one which we study these days. And if you haven't encountered this subject much before, then um, maybe that's why I'm giving this uh, sort of very brief introductory spiel. Um, very small numbers require an unusually large number of k powers in their representation. So if you pick a, an integer which is a little smaller than 3 to the k, you can only use uh, one to the k's and two to the k's in its representation. And that means that your number of summands is uh, higher than you might otherwise expect this to be. It grows uh, exponentially with k. Um, and it's fair to say that really we have a complete understanding of little g of k at this point and, and have done uh, for 40 years. Um, so so I say that this conjecture is essentially known, but the bound that I, the lower bound that I just presented is even holding with equality. Um, and that's more or less true. Um, it's work going back uh, from the 20th century, basically. Um, the most recent of which is a, not an easy thing. Um, little g of four took a long time to, uh, to unlock completely. But the upshot of this is that uh, this conjecture is known, or, or at least you know how to calculate g of k. So if you give me your favorite value of k, you can calculate it easily. Um, you can calculate what little j of k is very easily. And the reason why it's so easy is because of the small k powers. Um, somehow they're, in a certain sense, widely spaced apart uh, relative to their size. Um, once uh, your integers that you're taking care of powers of become large, then somehow the spacing becomes more regular. Um, so just for the uh, aficionados, and I guess people can look at this if they want to look back over the talk on video, um, this is what I mean by a complete understanding. So it's conjectured that the top line is all you need to know to calculate little g of k. But if you give me your favorite value of k, you know exactly what to do in order to determine what the correct formula is. Um, which means there's 
still work to do to really show that the conjecture holds, but that's a problem in Daffentan approximation and not a problem in analytic number theory. Okay, so good. So let's study the serious problem um, for this talk anyway, which is big G of K. And, um, and here we just seek to represent all the large uh, positive integers as sums of uh, at most SK powers. And we'd like to make S as small as possible. And that's what this big G of K is traditionally used to denote. So again, Lagrange's theorem, that's um, showing that big G of two is four. Um, you can't get away with three squares, but um, classical result. Um, and the first uh, modern contribution to the subject comes with Hardy and Littlewood's work in the century ago. So it wasn't the first of their papers on partitium. It was the one where they actually obtained an explicit bound and figured out uh, exactly how the singular series on that issue. So they showed that uh, an upper bound for the of k is at most something roughly k times 2 to the k. Um, so subsequently, there was a lot of development in this subject. Um, it's worth saying that the local solubility issues, which one has to take account of, um, similar to obstructions to using three squares to represent all large integers. So powers of two, um, when k is a power of two, for a two attic solubility issues one has to contend with. So big G of K might be as big as 4K, even conjecturally, when uh, K is a power of two. If K is not a power of two, well, the powers of three, which also make an appearance, but um, in general, big G of K would be the most free house of K. So certainly the correct order of magnitude for big G of K, we expect to be no worse than um, uh, order K much smaller than two to the k. And very rapidly work was um, which, uh, moved in that direction. Um, I've summarized uh, some of this, but not all of this here. Um, so Vinogradov was the first to get a, uh, take a polynomial bound in the 1930s and very rapidly using Vinogradov's mean value theorem, um, combined with diminishing ranges, all kinds of ideas this work, was able to get a bound which was of order k log k. And progressively, there were uh, interesting developments which caused this constant times k log k to be reduced. So in some sense, the natural uh, limit of the original ideas was free k log k by being grad of in 1947. And then uh, the subject kind of ground to a halt uh, in 1959, with this last bound due to Vinogradov, which is of order 2k log k. And it's fair to say that the, the argument of a proof here is um, quite involved. Uh, so, I mean, it's more and more the case uh, that people tend to look only at the recent uh, literature and recent records and don't dig into the historical development of subjects. And that's a, sort of a factor of online access to materials. Um, but it's well worth looking at Vinogradov's 1959 proof of this bound. There are um, ideas there which um, for many modern workers have been forgotten. Um, some, some very clever ideas which, uh, which allow him to use um, some of the developments involving Vinogradov's mean value firm, but other ideas to get this two, 2k log k bound. Quite a difficult argument. <clears throat> so the other bounds were um, uh, mentioned here are sort of minor refinements of these, really these are the breakthrough bounds. Okay, so, um, so this bound remained essentially unimproved um, until the mid-1980s when Karat Super and uh, Bob Vaughan um, made some use of smooth numbers and uh, I like to highlight, and so certainly Karat Super uses integers with small prime divisors to imitate some of the features of, of Vinogradov's approach. Imitate oh, Trevor, uh, apologies. Could I just uh, interrupt to pass on a question from Hershey Kiselewski about what the situation uh, becomes if you allow the, the cubes, for example, to be, to be negative? 
Uh, then you've got much more room. So this is a so-called easy awareness problem. Um, so in many circumstances, there are much sharper bounds available. Um, uh, and then in general, it's not necessarily that much easier. So, um, so, um, so then when the, the major advantage that one has is that the sum ends may be much larger than the integer that you're representing because the problem is indefinite. And this allows uh, use of polynomial identities, for example, to... Um, can I just interrupt a minute? I mean, I, it might actually be a harder problem because the, the corresponding number to, to g of, little g of k could be actually um, so small. That's, that's only true. So the upper bounds that you get, you can expect to be smaller, but the truth may also be expected to be much smaller. So, um, so that makes it a more challenging problem in some ways. Exactly. That's a good point. I, I hope that sort of answers, at least in part, the question there. Okay, so um, so back to the plot. Um, you know, we've got uh, Vinogradov's bound, and I mentioned these uh, improvements by Kaltsuvo and Vaughan using integers with small prime factors. Uh, and I'd really like to highlight uh, the contribution that, that Bob made here. Um, that Vaughan made. Um, so he really reformulated the um, or came up with a formulation of the use of integers with small prime factors in a way which makes it the method very flexible and capable of iterative processes and so on. And so if I could um, sort of draw an analogy, it's as if Karatsuba and some of the other developments in this line um, is some uh, sort of made for purpose device uh, that is very complicated to apply. You have to sort of reconfigure all the components every time you use it. Um, what Vaughan did was gave us a sort of a USB plug and play device um, you just pull it out of the out of the cupboard, plug it in, and use it for whatever purpose you want. And it's a very flexible device, and it was a, an important contribution. Um, so Vaughan, as you can see, um, improved on Vinogradov's bound. Um, uh, you, you have to look to see where the improvement is, maybe, but it's in this uh, log log k term. So one of the log log k's disappear disappears. Um, one has some explicit control here as well, the constant term. So still 2k log k. And then um, in my thesis, actually, um, I was able to save a factor roughly two. Um, and this is where this method, which I call the efficient, efficient differencing method. So it's not the efficient convincing method. Um, we shouldn't be confused. There are different methods. Um, I notice um, in Larry Goof's ICM paper, he sort of suggests that uh, I was working on efficient congruencing in the 1990s. It's not the case, these are different methods. Um, so, uh, and, well, I won't say very much about the actual method here because really the focus is somewhere else. Okay, that's a, by, by a finger slip, there you are. So I, but one of the big reveals of the talk anyway. So we've got an improvement now on this bound. Um, so the constant term, the constant in front of a k log k hasn't uh, changed, sorry, but the log log k term has disappeared. And all this big O stuff, that's disappeared as well. So there's a, an explicit bound, which is valid for all natural numbers k. It even works for k equals one, although the bound is not very impressive there because big G of one is one, but uh, still um, it's, it's definitely an improvement. And, and you know what I'd like to highlight is that progress in this subject has been very slow. So um, since Vinogradov, we had um, rather little progress for 30 years, and then another 30 years have gone by more than that, in fact. And, um, and at least we've saved the log log k term. Um, so the ideas are applicable for other topics as well. Um, but I thought we'd just uh, reveal you know, what happens with Rowan's problem a little more. Um, so, so one slight in, improvement on this bound, um, you know, I'd like to, um, to indicate the limit of the method. So the, the numerics work very nicely to obtain this bound. If you work a bit harder, you get a slight improvement, which is also explicit, but more closely um, indicates the limit of the method. So there are some constants which are defined by transcendental equations. Um, and the upper bound that you actually get for natural numbers, k again, is k log k plus c1k, where c1 is 
4.200189. So you can see it's very slightly smaller than the other constant there. Um, and uh, for large K, that makes a difference, but um, for small K, up until the 20,000s or so, this first theorem is, is stronger. Um, but as I said, this kind of indicates the limit of the method. So, um, so really, the second theorem is the challenge for improvement, um, even improving the C1 constant here. Okay, so uh, this suggests that maybe this is largely about large values of K. Um, one can say something about small values, and here's just a, a bit of um, history on the state of the art in this problem. Um, we have these classical results of Lagrange and uh, Linux on sums of cubes, sums of seven cubes. Uh, Davenport has this famous result on 16 fourth powers. Um, so these days, if you include local solubility conditions, you could take this down to 12, that's Peter Vaughan, or maybe even 11 if you impose an extra condition. Um, and so one has reasonable upper bounds on these things. Um, for small values of K, people have worked this all out. And, and I thought I'd just sort of uh, get a table of results here, which gives you some impression of what's going on. So, so these are values of big G of K upper bounds when K is between seven and 20. Um, you can see the conjectural bounds are impacted by local solubility conditions. Uh, rather large conjectural bounds uh, of k power of two, like eight and 16, um, but in general, quite small. And uh, here's Vaughan's 1989 bound. And you can see that um, with this repeated efficient differencing method, you save, well, asymptotically, it was a factor of two, but it was quite a sizable improvement, even for modest values of k. And then uh, Vaughan and I spent some time in the really this work um, goes up to about 1995, I guess, um, although it took longer to publish and write up. Um, so you, you gain something, a relatively small amount, but um, still, you know, these are the strongest bounds that were known at the time. Um, you save a few extra variables. And then uh, these remained unimproved up until 2016. So I came up with a, a minor arc estimate which utilized um, the main conjecture in Wienergrado's mean value theorem, which has now been proved. Um, and for relatively moderate values of K, um, one saves something from this mean value estimate. It's a very efficient minor arc bound for complete null sums. And as you can see, this saves you know, maybe four variables in this intermediate range, but it ceases to have an impact for, for K larger than 16. And then this, this recent work, um, which I'm talking about today, um, picks up um, in these intermediate ranges. So, so if this 2016 work hadn't existed, then the improvements would already start coming with k as small as eight. Um, but as it is, um, they start picking up um, for k at least 14. And then by the time we've gotten to 20, well, we've said five variables. Um, this this log log k term, which is being saved here, which you slowly start to see. So anyway, this um, this all has some sort of impact. Um, so I thought I should give a hint about how you know when I was writing this talk, I initially did not have this section free, and I had um, some other applications. You'll see some other applications in just a moment. Um, but I thought it would be unfair not to hint at what idea is new here right now, because um, you know if we're doing something novel. Um, you'd kind of like to know why enough you would have an improvement. Um, so if you're not an expert, um, if you're not involved in this kind of subject, um, maybe you're not going to get much out of this, but I promise that later on in the talk, there'll be a, a sort of a, a, something with more details that probably gives you more of an idea. So just in brief, um, all of these approaches use a circle method. And in the modern versions, um, we use smooth numbers, integers, uh, all of whose prime divisors are small powers of the, the variable, which are interesting, of the size of the variable. Um, so, you know, these are things which uh, are much studied in multiplicative number theory. Born introduced um, in this form anyway, um, in the circle method. And um, just to recap, experts know this. The object is to obtain minor arc estimates for uh, moments of these 
smooth file sums, minor arcs are sets of real numbers which are poorly approximated by rationals. Experts will know what I'm talking about. And you just try to use a soup norm over some of these file sums, mean value for the rest, and you hope to, to win something over the expected size of the corresponding uh, main term for major arc contribution. So you win something, you want to win something over the bound p to the t plus u minus k. Um, and then you try to optimize choices of t and u, um, and roughly speaking, the bound for big G of k will be the smallest that you can take t plus u so that this bound is achieved. Okay, so, um, so that's just uh, to provide a framework to talk about. So we have um, quite good uh, upper bounds for the mean values of these uh, smooth file sums, where you win an amount, um, well, so you don't quite achieve the optimal estimate, but you lose an amount which drops up exponentially. Okay. So here, I, I haven't made this an even moment, that's why there's an e to the minus u over k here. Um, but this is acceptable when u is a little larger than k log k. And it's the other stuff which is where everything interesting stuff is going on. So, um, so one can obtain upper bounds on this classical set of minor arcs, which I indicated before, where you win relative to the trivial estimate an amount, which is something like one, uh, one over k log k in the exponent. And it's this log k factor, which delivers the log log k term in the upper bounds of g of k. Now, there is work um, Level, which addresses what happens when you're on what I would like to think of as an extreme set of minor arcs, where um, the alpha are uh, somehow as uh, poorly rationally approximated as you could imagine modular deletions. Um, this is something which was investigated by Karat Suba and Keith Brown. And the idea also occurs in work going back to the 50s on the zero free reach and the zeta function. So there you, you get a bound on this extreme set of minor arcs where the log k isn't present. And there's a bound actually which is slightly better than this for constant 10 you can improve. Um, and the sharpest constants constant uh, what comes from the smooth number treatments. So, so the log k disappears and if you could use this then the log log k term would disappear from big G of k. So that's what you would like to use and so the problem that uh, Bruden and I um, address is how to handle the intermediate set of arcs which lie between the extreme set and the classical minor arcs which occur in the problem. And this, I should say, is, is motivated by work of um, uh, Jiang Yalu and uh, Li Lu Zhao um, on a, a cognate problem. Um, so they have a method which I'll say a bit more about. It's, um, it's uh, it's not as flexible as, as what we do, and, and indeed it wouldn't handle um, the situation we need to in this problem. Okay, so that's kind of a hint of, of what the new idea is that gives, that saves the log log k term in, in the picture of k. And so hopefully that if you're an expert and you're wondering, okay, when is he going to tell us what's going on? Well, I've hinted at it and we'll see more details later on, as long as I speed up a bit. Well, maybe not, I don't know. Um, Okay, so let's, uh, let's carry on. So how about some other applications? Um, so here's another application. Roth's ascending powers problem. So Klaus Roth, um, uh, really, I guess this was part of his thesis, I suppose, um, uh, looked at the problem of representing integers as sums of a square, a cube, and so on. Um, Can I just powers. interject? I think it was a master's thesis, not a PhD thesis. Master's thesis, okay. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting story to this, which would take too much time to tell, but uh, I f always think of this as, uh, as an analogue of what in chess would be called a, a finger slip variation. But uh, anyway, the story Bob can tell at a different point, maybe. Okay, so Roth managed to show that you can do this with um, at most 50 some amounts. And this has been a popular topic um, for various workers over the years. Um, so Vaughan and Fanny Gachalam and Bruden and other people have looked at this. 
and the most recent contribution is due to um, Lee and, and Zhao, um, the work I alluded to a moment ago, who showed that you can take acid mass to 13. Um, so I, I want to sort of jazz this up a little bit. Um, so what if you take the summands in an arithmetic progression? Um, that seems like something you could definitely do. And so there's a bit of notation here to do it. So somehow um, the starting point of the arithmetic progression is, is kind of a kth term, right? kq plus a. And then you just keep adding um, q every time to the, the exponent. Um, I do this just because I can. Um, so Roth's original problem, you know, q is one, a is zero, and you start with the, the square term. Good. Okay. So, um, so this kind of problem has also been studied by Kevin Ford in 1995. Um, so he, he looked at a problem where you have, you start with the k term and just add one to the exponent each time. And he showed that you could get away with k squared log k sum ends. Good. Well, okay. So um, uh, if you're over Wolf like last week, you saw some sort of announcement of this. And even that's why there's a plus here. This is being improved um, in real time. Um, so you can get an upper bound for this kind of result. And in particular, um, in the variant of the problem which Kevin looked at, instead of k squared log k, you can get away with actually a little less than 99 k squared variables. So the, the log k terms disappeared altogether. Um, and another variant we might look at is what happens if a is zero and uh, Q is K, for example, you know, something like this, where you, uh, you uh, sort of looking at uh, multiples of K. And you can see that you get good bounds for all of these things from this kind of result. Um, so again, this is something which um, the log K disappears because of the new sort of technology that's available. It's quite kind of satisfying. Another cognate problem. So what if you look at um, sums of an R free number and a number of kth powers. What could you do here? So, you know, maybe the simplest version of this is if you look at a square free number plus a number of kth powers. So, square free numbers have positive density, of course, and, uh, and so this gives one uh, confidence that one ought to be able to get a pretty good bound. Um, Sorry to interrupt, uh, Trevor. Uh, just from the previous one, what does the capital A depend upon? Uh, yeah, the capital A um, is just a, a, um, an absolute constant. Okay. Uh, I guess maybe we'll even write down a suitable uh, absolute constant in the, the final result, but uh, probably it will end up being something like 99. <laughs> okay, so, so back to the R3 numbers or square free numbers. So one observation is that um, if you have roughly half big G of K variables, where big G of K is actually, in, uh, if I'm honest about this, it's the upper bound that you're able to prove using the methods um, from the circle method, which we're talking about here. Uh, it's just a shorthand for uh, this uh, kind of notion. So I'm being a little sloppy. Um, well, technology in the subject allows you to show that almost all integers are sums of roughly a half G of K, K powers. So in particular, you've got a set of positive density even um, the exceptional set has density zero. Um, well then um, your set which excludes a set of density zero um, has to talk with this square free number or R free number and you'll end up representing all large integers. So the upper bound for this uh, PR of K is certainly at most um, half of big G of K half of k log k, let's say. And you can jazz this all up a bit and uh, actually do a little better. So um, for our three numbers, you could get something quite easy, which would give one over r plus one k log k is your upper bound. Um, here I'm thinking of r as being fixed, so, um, and k as being sufficiently large. So, so you shouldn't think of r as being um, a, a super large number in terms of k. Don't think of r as being e to the k. That's, that's uh, silly talk. Um, so um, think of R as being fixed. Okay, so a constant times K log K. Uh, well, um, the kind of result you can prove using these new ideas 
would be a constant time scale. So the log k again has disappeared. And the constant, you can write down explicitly what it is for square free numbers. It's a little bit uh, larger than one times k. Um, when r is large, well, you know, think of r as, as growing slowly with k maybe. Um, then this number is, this constant is very small. So, so I'd just like to expand a little bit on that, um, just to draw a consequence. So if you think of r as growing slowly with k, all of this still works, um, then you've got a essentially epsilon k positive integral k powers. And this set of k powers uh, represents a very thin set of integers. So we've got an r free number plus a very thin set um, representing all large integers. So this is certainly a subconvexity result in the Seppel method. Um, you have to beat the square root barrier, and that's exactly what happens. Um, not surprisingly, it's the r three numbers that help you do that. Um, but still, this this is. Um, it's kind of a challenge, you know, come up with a better, a better um, approach which delivers stronger results. Okay, so that's um, another cognate problem, and here's a, a, another cognate problem, um, and this will be the last example. So you could look at a prime plus a number of k powers, and this is something that Hardy and Littlewood looked at in the um, a century ago. Um, they had all kinds of conjectures about uh, problems involving primes and k powers. Um, and it's worth highlighting here that um, this, this is kind of an analog of a Goldbach type problem in some sense. It's um, sort of inhomogeneous. Um, there's a difference between this kind of problem and representing primes as sums of k powers. And you see this most, most evidently um, in looking at the problem with two squares, right? So Fermat. And probably this was known to uh, to people before Fermat. Um, and I'm sure historical experts in the audience will have their own ideas on who first proved this. I don't want to get into that. Um, at least three centuries ago, uh, it was known that uh, primes convert to one mod four the sum of two primes. Uh, two squares. Ha! I knew there was going to be a typo somewhere. Okay, the sum of two squares. Um, the corresponding inhomogeneous problem, um, where you try to represent n as a prime plus two squares, right? Two squares here. Um, this was uh, tackled only, um, well, you can see, you know, 60 years ago, basically, by Hooley and, uh, and by Lynch. So it's a much harder problem. Okay, so what about uh, the general situation? So the same line of reasoning as we had um, on the earlier slide would uh, show you that half k log k variables are allowed. Um, and we can do a bit better in the homogeneous problem. Um, so uh, Kawada, Rudin, and I, about 20 years ago, used some, uh, I guess, circle method and kind of sieve ideas to get roughly eight thirds of k. K powers representing uh, primes. Um, okay, so uh, what about the inhomogeneous problem? Well, here's a theorem. So, um, so in general, one can get by with a little bit more than two times K, uh, K primes. So 2.144, et cetera, um, K primes. Um, okay, and again, this uses some of the ideas which um, underlie the present discussion. Doesn't need quite as much, but um, certainly the same ideas play a role. Um, and this is unconditional. If you are prepared to assume um, GRH, then you actually go a little below two times K. Um, so again, I would view this as something of a challenge. Um, so uh, these are results you can get from the circle method. With this new idea, oops. Um, so uh, it's a challenge to, to do better by using other ideas, maybe um, much heavier use of sieves or hybrid methods. It's a good, a good problem to look at. Okay, so those are um, some results, you know, which I hope are accessible. And now I'd like to get into the, um, the methods a little bit. And um, 
so you know there's a bit of background to really um get into uh what about the methods uh, changes for, for what's accessible um if you're an expert some of this will look uh quite um quite easy and sort of uh, familiar if you're not then um i have to admit you're, you're going to get a, an impression of what's going on probably not the, the full story so certainly um well i sketched earlier what some of the um, motivation is right so so some of this will be working to that we've got smooth numbers integers that are divisible only by um, small primes um, so uh, people have different ideas about what smooth numbers can be called and i stick with smooth so uh, i think that's a perfectly good name um so we've got our exponential sum over these smooth numbers and think of p as large and r as being a very small power of p. That's the way to think about this. And we have mean values of these objects, which also play a role. So that's all something that I covered before. Um, now, I want to focus on to sort of specialize the situations so that it makes life a bit easier to explain the ideas. And so think of s as being um, at least as large as the number of variables we need in in Waring's problem now. Um, so we're interested in representing an integer n. Um, p is going to be n to the 1 over k. And um, remember, our smooth valve sum is defined in terms of p. By orthogonality, this integral here counts the number of representations of n as the sum of s k powers of smooth integers. And if we're able to give a good lower bound for RSK of n, the small value, then uh, we'll be able to show that big G of k is bounded by this value of s, and that's going to give us our result. The standard setup for a second method algorithm. Um, if you haven't encountered this before, you may be wondering about these smooth numbers. Well, um, I've chosen the smoothness parameter in a way so that the density of the set is positive density, positive proportion of all the integers have um, this level of smoothness. And you can write asymptotics for these things. And it's fairly easy to show that um, the, uh, <clears throat> the major up contribution, which I'll say something about in a moment, to this representation problem is a positive proportion of the conjectured um, asymptotic or conjectured lower bound for the number of representations, which is written in terms of gamma functions and um, the standard singular series in the problem. So in other words, the smooth numbers play well with the um, usual applications of Rand's problem, uh, of simple methods of Rand's problem. And that's something that Vaughan um, figured out. Okay, so um, the convenient choice of major arcs would have rational approximations to points in the unit interval of width, which is a power of log times um, p to the minus k. And in reality, there's some pruning that has to go on. You have to expand these, these regions which you cover, uh, but I'll, I'll hide that. Um, I just want to say this in order to say that uh, the major arc analysis is, is by now very well understood. Even with s as small as I don't know, two k plus three, it would be very easy to prove this lab. So, um, so we can focus on the corresponding minor arcs, and that's what um, all these new ideas address. I want to show the corresponding minor arc contribution of little l PTS minus k, and that's where the fun starts. Um, so, and, and here. Um, this is not a very satisfactory slide, but I'm, I'm going to present it anyway, just so that uh, experts really get a better idea for what goes on. So you can subdivide this set of minor arcs into uh, what you can think of as a standard, um, I think of them as standard complexity. So you have rational approximations to alpha, where um, if you look at any points inside these subsets, um, the width of the intervals is measured in terms of p to the minus k. That's what this p is doing here. And um, how close you are to p to the minus k is measured by q. And we want to make sure that um, the, q, the 
you're never too close to an A over Q. Somehow you're at least maybe Q over two, capital Q over two away from A over Q. And also um, that the denominators involved are also not too, not too big, they're larger than capital Q over two. So you're sort of um, making sure that the complexity of these alpha in the sense I like to think of this is of order of magnitude Q, capital Q. So you know how complicated these points are. It's a fairly standard idea these days. So um, efficient congruency plays a role here. I alluded to this earlier. So, um, so you get good uh, bounds for these mean values of, of uh, smooth R sums. And now um, I want to apply Dirichlet's theorem to obtain a rational approximation to alpha, which is somehow as efficient as possible. So the denominator is at most p to the k over two, and the approximation is like p to the k over two. And this is the situation where this work of Karatsuba and Heath Brown and effectively myself um, comes in. So if you apply all of this work, you get an upper bound in this extreme region. Um, if the denominator is almost as big as it could possibly be, you get a, an upper bound which um, wins over a trivial estimate or one of a constant k. And the best constants here come from the repeated efficient differencing method. So there's a formula there which you don't need to pay attention to, it's there, so I'm honest. Um, okay, and, and the comparisons I've said before, the classical minor arc bounds would, would have a one of a k log k there instead of one of a constant k. So that's where we win. And now if I define this new object, delta s star, it's kind of a best possible situation, as we'll see in a moment, where I um, pull out a suit norm on these extreme minor arcs of this file estimate, and that's where the minus t tau of k comes in and uh, estimates remaining um, mean value using this repeated efficient difference in bound. So, so this is kind of like a minor arc exponent. And uh, one version of the results uh, which we're using is this uh, minor arc bound for intermediate arcs. And it doesn't matter where Q is here, not too much anyway, but you get a bound which saves almost optimally and what's left over depends on this minor arc exponent. And if delta S star is negative, then you're winning something here. You're getting a bound which is good for uh, getting minor arc bounds in uh, applications of the method to warehouse problem, for example. That's really the objective. Um, so just some, some words on what Liu and Zhao do. So, um, so this, uh, set of intermediate arcs n uh, is taking out the low complexity part and Lu and Zhao uh, don't do that. Um, the method doesn't allow them to do that. And even they're not really using um, this set of major arcs. Um, they have to have some equal width major arcs in order that a large sub inequality be applicable. So you end up with something which doesn't play well with many applications of the circle method. So it's, it's a little bit tough. Also, S has to be large, which would exclude uh, these applications, for example, with R3 numbers. Uh, and then the smooth valve sums which you look at have to be more like the, the proud super smooth valve sums, so they're less flexible for applications. Uh, so this is all, um, certainly this bound here, which you see in the theorem, where other examples you'll see later on, I hope, um, is more in the plug and play mold that Vaughan had rather than this very carefully arranged um, setup of a new apparatus every time you need to use it. Okay, and also it does more well as well. I mean, it actually gives you minor arc bounds um, uh, when you win something. Uh, the Lu and uh, work does not do that. Okay, so, so I can say. Um, now where this bound comes from, at least to give a sketch of where it comes from. The key idea is to use the smooth property of the smooth numbers. Um, the fact that all the integers are divisible only by small primes to extract from every summand x to the k in your smooth file sum, 
a factor which is very close to your favorite size. And that favorite size will be m to the k. And we'll choose m later on. So if you do this, um, what we're really saying is that I'm choosing a w dividing x of the right size. Because the prime factors are all very small, I miss only by a very small factor, my favorite size. And so I'm going to pretend that I, that I hit that size bang on, more or less. So I can use Holder's inequality now to factorize the sum ends and force um, these W factors to all be of the same size in all of the sum ends. And, and so you get a, an upper bound for a mean value. And I'll, I'll use the, the set M, the subscript Q just means that I'm looking at denominator Q. That was defined in the notation, but I don't expect you to remember that. Um, so we've got a mean value now, which um, I force one factor to be all the same in these. And, and the vowel sum has been shortened now. Instead of having length P, it has length P over W. Okay. And the point is that these arcs now are built out of intervals. They're small neighborhoods of A over Q. Yeah. A and Q co-prime. Um, and the intervals um, have a specified width. But if I look at alpha W to the K, the width has changed. So alpha W to the K now lies in an interval which is actually W to the K times wider. Um, and I've written that in a form which emphasizes um, how it depends on the length of the exponential sum P over W. So this looks very nice. There's an L A W to the K over Q here. Um, but, um, but if uh, A W, if A and Q are co-prime and W and Q are co-prime, then I'm just in a sense, permuting um, the residues mod Q, uh, reduced residues mod Q, when I multiply by W to the K. So what I'm actually doing is mapping um, the original set of arcs under the scaling to a new set of arcs which uh, correspond nicely to the shorter length of the exponential sum. Um, and I, I can make a change of variable in the integration to remove the alpha W to the K and make it a beta and that gives me a w to the minus k here. So somehow the smooth numbers are perfectly set up for this. The problematic part, which takes some effort to, to deal with, and this is where the, um, the somehow the skill set comes in, you know, um, and I, to do this one can use techniques um, very similar to what I used in work on breaking classical convexity in Rand's problem you know, back in the 90s. Um, you, you have to work with a, a very careful decomposition of the exponential sums for smooth parts to arrange that you've got this uh, factor of suitable size co-prime to Q, which you can use. Uh, that takes um, some delicacy. It's not trivial. And especially we're not looking at mean values over a complete interval. We really have to do this um, precisely because we're, we've got integrals that don't have any obvious stuff into an interpretation. Okay, well, sticking with a slightly simplified problem, um, we can now make a choice of M, the size, our favorite size, so that um, when we um, insert this choice of M, remember W has size roughly M, um, the upper bound that we get is in terms of major arcs where um, the size of the variables is, uh, so, so the width of the intervals is like Q, the size of the variables is like Q to the two over K. And it's, this is actually scaled, so we're now at exactly that kind of extreme uh, end of the minor arcs, which we wanted to target. So this is this is kind of perfect. Um, and with this set of major arcs M, I'm actually, I've got something like the complete interval here. And that's the upper bound that I wrote down. But if I'm able to do this with um, these major arcs where I take out the middle part, so I really have complexity, which is measured by the parameters, and that's what we do then even this gives you minor arc information using this very strong minor arc bound with origins with work of Carol Suba and Leif Brown. Um, so anyway, we know what to do with all of this at this point. M is like P Q to the minus two over K. Um, this is an exponential sum of length Q to the two over K. We've got upper bound of size S minus uh, Q to the two over K, S, S minus K plus delta and just do a bit of bookkeeping. This is P to the S minus K times this power of Q. Everything works 
you to fit, you know, as, as you should. Um, so, um, so that sort of hints at, at the idea, the scaling idea, and you can do this all relative to things which are called minor arcs. Um, and <clears throat> just to sort of summarize um, what, uh, what, uh, sort of a keen result can look at. And this, this I regard as something which for many, many purposes probably is a plug and play result for people who might want to use this kind of stuff. Um, so what this result is saying is that you imagine the um, exponent that you get by assuming you have this very strong minor arc bound that you only get on the extreme end of the minor arcs um, in your traditional version of um, application of the circle method. And um, you have some, something else which is innocent. This isn't going to hurt you. And what you get is a, an upper bound for minor arcs of traditional type where the complexity, the denominators are measured in terms of Q, which could be any, anything between one and P to the K over two. And you get an upper bound, which is as good as you expect, um, where you win a power of capital Q. As long as delta S star is negative, and so, you know, this ought to be good enough to apply in almost any conceivable situation. Good. Um, so I think uh, that's where I can end. And so uh, the advertised new world record um, is, is sitting right there. That's a challenge for anybody to, to do something with. So anyway, thank you for your attention.